How many of you have ever wondered why we take communion every week? I'm sure some of you have wondered about this. Come on now, all right? I'm sure, you know, I mean, uh, and, and for some of us, maybe you've never really wondered why because you've just always done it. And, and you don't really maybe know why we do it every week. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to try to answer some questions. Today is communion. We're going to talk about baptism next week. Why, why do we have baptisms like the ones that we just saw? We're going to talk about prayer. Why do we pray? We talk a lot about how to pray and what to pray for, but how, why do we do that? And then we're going to talk about giving to wrap things up at the end of the month. So th this series, I hope, will answer some questions, maybe spur some discussion. I know our Wednesday night Engage class will discuss it even more, so it'll be a great time for you to come back and maybe ask more questions and have more interaction with Travis as he leads our adult group. But I think that this series will hopefully answer some of these questions. And the basis of this series comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. If you look in verse 42, it says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So if we look here at what it says in this verse, everything that the church was doing was centered around this, around the, the teaching of the apostles, of being together, of sharing meals together, of praying together. Now this phrase, breaking bread, is often a phrase that's used to refer to what we call today communion. And, and these people were devoted to it. That's what it says. They were devoted to it. They weren't half-hearted about it. They weren't uh, one, one foot in, one foot out. They were fully devoted to what they believed. And so they shared this intimate, wonderful moment with each other on an ongoing basis of communion. Now, if you look on in verse 43, it says that everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs that were performed by the apostles. So they were all in, and they, and they knew why they were doing what they did. They were devoted, and so the people in the world around them saw that. And in verse 44 and 5, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common, and they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. We're going to talk about giving at the end of this series, but what we also see taking place here is unity. The people were united together, working together. They loved Jesus, and they loved each other. And, and when I pray every day, I, I have a time of prayer uh, every day in the morning, an extended time of prayer, and one of the things I pray for every day, I've been doing this for years, is for this unity to grow deeper within our church and within the church is in our community because it's that important and then in verse 46 it says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising god and enjoying the favor of all the people and the lord added to their number daily those who were being saved so so the people saw this unity the people saw this devotion to the work of Christ in their life, and they were mesmerized by it. They wanted to know more about it, and we know that the early church was growing by leaps and bounds. We know on Pentecost, thousands came to know Jesus. And so today, we're going to talk about communion, and we're going to look at some of these other things that I already mentioned, and we're going to learn why communion is so important and why we even do it. You know, one of the earliest memories that I have of communion uh, was when I was probably about five or six years old. I remember that once in a while, um, our church that I went to, here, I got a picture of it actually. This is Community Christian Church in Lake Worth, Florida. This was the church that I went to growing up. Um, it's now a Hispanic congregation, which is really, really cool. And this church uh, would have us in the sanctuary. We do this here every fifth Sunday. Our kids would be in the church. And I remember we would have communion when I was about five years old. And we had the little glass cup communion cups. So whenever you'd get them out, they were always clinking. Did any of you ever remember that? That's like one of the sounds I remember as a kid, is these clanking glass communion cups. Now, we use plastic ones now because it's just easier, right? We don't have to wash them. And I remember there was a lady uh, in our church. Her name was Mrs. Rao. I've, I've shared with you before. She was the candy lady at our church. She gave us candy when we recited the verses of the Bible or the books of the Bible. But she was also the communion lady. She washed the, di the cups all the time. So I remember there was a little room and we'd go back and wash them. But I remember as a kid wondering to myself, what is this really all about? Why are we 
why are we having snack time in the middle of church, right? Like, like why are we eating crackers and drinking grape juice? Um, I, I remember uh, some years ago when I was doing children's ministry, I, I had a kid uh, that came up to me and said, I really like that snack during class today, you know? It, it was just, there was just this uh, idea, and I had the same idea too when I was their age, uh, of what is this really about? What is communion really all about? And, and, and for some of us today, it might still seem kind of like a foreign or strange concept. And so I think it's really important to answer this question and to give you a little bit of a background before we, we get into it. We're going to be actually today in Matthew chapter 26. This is going to be our, our main passage that we're going to look at today because in Matthew 26, we see that Jesus is just hours away. He is just hours away from dying on the cross for your sins and mine. Just hours away. And he finds himself in this environment where he is going to share some of his last words before he goes the, through this, this horrible experience of dying for us. And just before he, he is arrested, we know that he reflects with his disciples and he shares with them about the core of what they're there for. And, and, and really, it sets the stage for the centrality of what we celebrate here in our church every Sunday, and that is communion. When we have communion every week, you might notice that most weeks, we haven't had it yet today, and there's a reason. We're going to have it later in our service. But, but it's usually at the very center of our time of worship. And why is that? Because it's really a communion that we find our very purpose and the very core of who we are. It's not, yes, we, we worship and we sing to God. Yes, prayer is important. Yes, hearing from the Word and sharing like I'm doing right now is important. But all of this, all of the stuff that goes on in our worship service, all of the things that happens during the week through our church, everything that you do in your life is based around what communion represents, and that is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and that he gave his body and his blood for you and me. So, so Jesus is with his disciples here in Matthew 26, and he's sharing with them what their mission was going to be. And so let's go ahead and read it. We're going to start in verse 17. And we're going to stop at a few places, talk about a few things as we go along the way. But here's what it says. On verse 17, it says, On the first day of the week, uh, or on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So many of you may know what the Passover is. Passover is usually around the time of Easter. Our church, we have done what are called Seder dinners. And a Seder dinner would take place during the passover and so jesus says to his disciples hey we got to get things together for this passover meal it was very common for the jewish people at that time to to go out and they would shop and get everything ready it wasn't like just running down to like dollar general or walmart to get your groceries okay this was something that took a lot of time and a lot of preparation and so he asked his disciples to go ahead and to start get get ready to do that and so it was in this event this this time of Passover that Jesus gives us communion and he connects communion with what the Passover was about it do you remember what the Passover is about it's it's about celebrating how the angel of death passed over Israel just before they were released from Egypt okay so that's what they celebrated that's what they remembered how death had passed over them and so now Jesus was about to share with them something that was really important to them and would be important to us in verse 18 he said go into a certain to the city to a certain man and tell him the teacher says my appointed time is near i'm going to celebrate the passover with my disciples at your house and so the disciples did as jesus had directed and prepared the passover so the disciples they had to have some trust here didn't they i mean could you imagine that say uh, go up to some guy that you don't even know and say hey we're going to come over to your house and have a meal what if you did that today? Like, <laughs> they would probably look at you like, what in the world? You know, why are you inviting yourself over to my house? But Jesus said that he will know. So there was obviously some kind of a relationship there with Jesus. And so that's what they do. They trust Jesus' word. And so they get ready for this Passover by going over to this person's house, this man's house, all right? And they go out and they get the bread that's associated with Passover. There were bitter herbs. There was wine you would buy. You would have to take a lamb and have it slain, have it sacrificed at the temple, and then you would bring it back. So this was a lot of work. This wasn't, like I said, like just going down to the store. It took a lot of time. 
And so after everything's ready and everything's prepared, it says in verse thir- or 20, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sad and began to say to, say to him, one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Talk about a downer, right? You're getting ready for this amazing meal together, and you're going to celebrate the Passover, and you're sitting down with this man that you've seen do all these amazing miracles. He's raised people from death to life. He's healed the blind. He's healed the lame. He's walked on water. He's calmed storms. He's done all these things. And then he says, hey, one of you guys has betrayed me. And of course, everybody in the room starts looking around at each other like, it wasn't me, was it you? No, it wasn't me. And, and they're all passing these accusations. Everybody in the room was very surprised at this statement. And, and the thing is, is that they didn't know that Judas was, that he was stealing from them. He had been stealing from them for a while. They, but they didn't, they didn't know about this because if you notice, Jesus still loved Judas. <laughs> he didn't treat Judas any differently than the rest of them. I think because they didn't know who the betrayer was says a lot about who Jesus is. Because he didn't treat him any differently. Maybe, maybe a, a good message for us, maybe. But unfortunately, Judas had been trying to hide his sin. Of course, you can't hide your sin from God. You couldn't hide it from Jesus. And Jesus could have done a lot of things to Judas in that moment of betrayal. He could have struck him down, but that's, that's not what he did. When you, when you look at the story, his, his heart's broken. He just uses one weapon on Judas, and that weapon's love. He still loves Judas. And Jesus says in verse 23, or Jesus replies in verse 23, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. And then Judas the one who would betray him said, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, you have said so. If you, if you look in John chapter 13, it gives you a little bit more of what happens after that. It says that Judas goes off and does his dirty work. He goes off and betrays Jesus, as we know, for 30 pieces of silver. And, but, but the very event, I don't know if you've ever thought of it like this before, but when you take communion, the very event that preceded communion, that we celebrate every Sunday here at our church was preceded by a betrayal. You ever thought of it like that before? Now, I, I think that's very fitting, actually, if you think, if you think a little bit more about it. Because isn't each of us, aren't each of us, don't we each have a little bit of Judas in us? We've all betrayed Jesus in some way, through our sin, through mindsets through our words actions we've all betrayed jesus in some way and so i think it it makes perfect sense and and like G- judas jesus in moments of communion but just life in general wants to confront us in our sin not not to get us not to to make us uh feel like worthless people no that's not what his point is his point is to change us to motivate us to be different. And, and so that, that's what he was hoping here, but of course Judas goes off and betrays him, and in verse 26, it says that while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his, to his disciples, saying, take and eat, for this is my body. I think it's, it's pretty neat how Jesus uses one of the most simple things that we take for granted here it refers to it as bread it's unleavened bread because that's what passover meals would have would have unleavened bread that's bread that hasn't rose so it's kind of like a cracker kind of like what we have too right on sunday morning it's it's something that's thin it's like almost like a wafer but he uses something basic and simple to give us the most profound teaching of what he was giving up for us giving up his very body his very essence his very humanity He was going to give his humanity to the ones who had betrayed him. And then in verse 27, it says, He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So, So the very thing that would give us life would be Jesus 
giving up his life. You know, there are some people that um, have taught through the centuries um, something called transubstantiation. I want to I want to try to be careful. Can you all say that five times fast? Like, you know, transubstantiation. All right. It's a tongue twister. I remember when I first heard it when I was in college, I was like, how do you say that? But it, but it's a really important doctrine. And, and here's what it is. There are, there are some churches, most of it's most of them are Roman Catholic, who believe that when you take communion, it is the actual body and blood of Jesus. That's why oftentimes you'll see a priest that kind of blesses it before communion because they believe that it becomes the actual body and blood of Jesus. Now, I think there are a lot of issues or a lot of problems with that teaching. The problem is that one of them is that when Jesus gave the meal of communion, he had not even died on the cross yet. So, so how could he have been like giving him his literal body when he hasn't even died yet? I think that's, that's one problem with the teaching. And then we also see here that he doesn't ever speak of it as his very... If you dig into the language, it doesn't say that he's giving, like this is his actual body. Another thing with transubstantiation is that it came centuries later. The first 1,200 years of the church did not believe in the idea of transubstantiation, that the actual body and blood of Jesus is there when you take communion. The other thing I would say, too, is that we don't want to continually sacrifice Jesus over and over again, which is really what you're doing when you believe in transubstantiation. So when Jesus shares these words, he's not saying that this is his literal body and blood. They are representative of his body and blood for our sins, what he had given up for you and me. And then in verse 29, he says, I tell you, and, and this is a verse maybe that we overlook sometimes, but I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We talked about heaven here uh, in our last series. We spent a few weeks talking about it. And one of the most glorious things that will happen when we go to heaven is that we will actually have communion with Jesus, which I think is another reason why transubstantiation doesn't make sense because Jesus is going to eat his own blood and his own body sounds kind of weird, right? So, no, but it's what it represents. You are going to eat it and partake in it with him. See, that's why when we partake in it on, on Sunday mornings, that's why it's such a wonderful thing, because in a, in a sense, we're kind of rehearsing for the big meal that's going to come. There's a big meal that's going to come, and, and it's a rehearsal, it's a celebration of being prepared to do that. Now, there's also something else that's important here. The word communion when you think of the word communion, what do you think about? You should think of actually, you know, receiving the tray like we do here at our church. You receive the tray and you partake of it. We think that's communion. But, but honestly, that's just something you do during communion. What communion is, it's a time for people to be together in sharing in the body and blood of Jesus. Community is central to communion. That's why we do it together. That's why they did it together there it's the unifying force that brings us all together it's the body and blood of jesus it doesn't matter how much money you make it doesn't matter who your friends are it doesn't matter where you go to school it doesn't matter where you live when you partake in communion it is a unifying event that brings us together and reminds us of what brings us together who brings us together and that is jesus so no matter whether you take communion in India or Africa or China or here in the United States or in Europe, we all have one unified connection together. That's why it's so important that we are a part of the church body where we take the communion together. We take this together. Now, th this does beg a question, though. How often should you take communion? Because right here, even in our own community, if you go over into uh, maybe other churches and other communities, everybody does it a little bit differently. We, we partake in communion every week, as you've probably seen. If you've been coming here for a while, we partake in communion every week. But there are some that do it quarterly, some do it monthly, some do it yearly. Some might do it at holidays, maybe like at Easter or Christmas. And, and it, it is kind of confusing to know why we do it every week. And, and the reason we do is if you look in 1 Corinthians, chapter 11 verse 26 here's what it says it says that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes we also know from some other passages in the new testament that they partook of it on the first day of the week 
Now, the, the reason why I, I bring this up is because Jesus never, Jesus never gave us a set number of times you should take communion. He doesn't say, okay, he, he doesn't give him the communion on that Passover night there just before his death and say, and make sure you do this every week. <laughs> you know, he doesn't say that. But as we look at early practice in the church, they would do it on the first day of the week. And I would argue that there are even some passages that say that it was done more often even than that. As a matter of fact, it might have been almost every day of the week that they would come together. Anytime the, the followers of Jesus would come together, they would partake in communion together. So I think there's an argument to be made that we should be doing it more, not less. And why? It's because of what Paul writes here in, in 1 Corinthians 11. He says it is to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's to proclaim the gospel until he comes. And, and, and I, I don't think we should just be proclaiming that once a year. <laughs> we should be, really, honestly, we should be proclaiming it more than once a week. We should be proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. That's what it was all about for the early church, and that's what it is for us. So, again, I think it's important for us to reflect and think more often than maybe what we do about what this means. It's important to repent and reflect, because that, that's part of what communion is. We need to do that more often. You know, some people say that we shouldn't, you shouldn't take communion a lot because it lessens its importance. I've heard people say that to me before, that if you do it every week, it just kind of becomes a routine. But if that's the case, then we shouldn't be reading our Bibles every week, because then it can become routine. Or, or we shouldn't be praying every week, because it becomes too routine. There are some things in life where routine is good. There are good routines. There are good habits. There's bad habits too. And we can have bad habits when it comes to communion sometimes. But God wanted to establish in us a habit of remembering what our mission is as a church and as a people, as followers of Jesus. And so today, I, I wanted to just talk with you a minute about what the point is and, and dig into to the actual act of communion and what we do, Okay. And so the point today I want to share with you is this, is that communion connects and redirects. That is what the point of communion is about. Communion connects us and it redirects us, and we need that. You might not have noticed, but in everything that Jesus was sharing with his disciples through this really simple meal, right, this piece of bread and this wine, this fruit of the vine, all right, he saw it as an act that connected them with him, connected them with each other. Again, communion is about community. And when we partake of it together, it changes us. And we're changed together. Following Jesus was never intended to be an individual event. <laughs> Where we go through each day and we follow Jesus on our own. That's not, that's not what following Jesus is about. Unfortunately, I've ran into a few people that they say, I don't need to go to church, and I don't need to be a part of the church community, and, and that just goes, it flies in the face of everything Jesus taught, because we need each other. We need each other to grow in our faith. I, I like what uh, the writer of Hebrews says. He says this in verse 24. He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in their habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. See, as a, as a, when we come together and we participate in communion together and we remember the very central core of who we are and what we're about, it's an encouragement to us and a reminder to us that when we go back out to work, when we go to our school, when we hang out with our friends, when we go to work, when we go out on the ball field, no matter what we do, that our very mission and the very core of who we are is to follow Jesus. So we show Jesus on the ball field and in our class and in our workplace and in our families and our houses. That is what it's about. We, we come together, we find that encouragement together to then go out into the world. And that's why it's so important. But here's the thing. If we're going to have a powerful communion experience, it requires the right approach. A powerful communion experience requires the right approach. We'll put that up here on the screen, okay? Just because we're coming together, though, doesn't mean that we're going to have a great communion experience. So when you come in here each Sunday morning, just because you might say, okay, I'm going to have communion today, and I'm here, there, that's, that's good, I'm going to have a good communion experience. That's, that's just not the way it works. 
we have to really be connected to it. We have to be involved in it. We have to, it has to be a, it, it, we have to truly connect so that we can be redirected. And there are a lot of things that can go through our minds. Here's a video to show you what might go through some of your minds when you're participating in communion time. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Did I let the dog out this morning? I need to do laundry so the kids have clothes for school. Oh my gosh, the insurance payment is due this week. I'm so hungry. What should we have for lunch? Ooh, I wonder when Grey's Anatomy comes back on. When the rain stops, I need to mow the yard. I wonder how long until we or go on vacation. Eat this bread and drink oh my goodness, this Blake Shelton's coming to Deer Creek. I gotta get my tickets. Until he comes. Wait, what just happened? Yeah, and, and has that happened to you before? Maybe, maybe not thinking about, I would not be thinking about Blake Shelton concert, or whatever, right? That wouldn't be me, but, but, you know, just fill in the blank of whatever group you like, okay? But, but no, all of us have had that happen to us. We're in communion time, and we get distracted. Maybe something happened that morning. Maybe we've got something going on later in the day or the week, or there's some big issue or problem in our life, and it, Communion has to be a moment. Communion has to be a time where we stop and where we reflect and where we think about who Jesus is. And we have to push all these things aside. And I know that it's really, really hard. We have to... The thing is about communion is that we have to look back so that we can look forward. You know, in Colossians chapter 2, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. See, communion is when you remember that your sin was passed over. It's remembrance. That's what Jesus said. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we look back so that we can move forward. We look back at where we have messed up. We look back at where we have come short so that we can think about where we're going forward. I mean, if you're a student at school, it's a moment for you to stop and think, okay, this is something I said to somebody at school I probably shouldn't have said. God, help me to, to look back so that I can look forward. Maybe if, it's a, if you're married or you have a friend and you've said something unloving, it's an opportunity for you to look back so you can go forward. See, communion is when you remember that your sin was passed over. But see, focusing on sin that has re resulted in your life uh, is not for Jesus, because he knows your sin. <laughs> when, when, you're, when you're reflecting and you're remembering him and you're remembering your own sin, you're not doing that as a way of saying, hey, Jesus, here, here just in case you didn't know. Because <laughs> he knows. He knows your sin. He knows what's going on in your life. You know, there's this axiom that maybe you've heard before that those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. You ever heard that before? The same can happen in our lives. If we don't look back and look at the sin in our lives and we don't confront it and allow Jesus to confront it, then, well, well then we're doomed oftentimes to repeat it. Um, I want to, I want to play a little game with us today. I haven't done this, something like this in a little while. We're going to do something here to kind of get you moving. I need everybody, um, our communion guys, you guys stood up a little early on me, all right? Sorry, okay? All right? Why don't everybody stand up for me? Everybody stand up. We're going to do a little game. That's right. Now, this will wake you up too, okay? All right? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you some things, and when, <clears throat> when I share it with you and you don't remember it, you sit down, okay? So I'm going to share with you different things that have happened through the generations. When you don't remember actually experiencing it, you sit down. You might have heard of it before. That's not what I'm saying. It's when you actually experienced it. Okay, so let's go back in time to the 2010s when there were selfie sticks and Angry Birds apps and fidget spinners. Everybody in here probably somewhat remembers that, right? So everybody will stand. Now, now we'll start seeing some things change. How many of you remember the VTech games? How many of you remember Silly Bands and Wonder Pets? 
If you don't remember that, go ahead and sit down. All right, so we're starting to see some, some seats going down, all right? All right, then came the 1990s. We had Beanie Babies, and we had, how many of you remember the phrase when it first came out? Cha-ching. Yeah, all right. All right, anybody, okay, if you don't remember that, go ahead and sit down, okay? Let's go back to the 80s. How many of you played Pac-Man? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I played Pac-Man, yeah. The Rubik's Cube, Rubik's Cubes and Leg Warmers, the Fraggles TV show. Anybody remember that? Okay, some of you remember that. We still got some of you standing up, okay? How many of you remember eight-track tapes? This is where I would have to sit down, all right? Um, how many of you remember eight-track tapes? How many of you wore leisure sh suits and platform shoes? I was going to say, Brandon, you wore platform shoes? <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, let's go back a little further. How many of you remember LPs? and lava lamps when they first came out when they first came out you all remember that okay all right okay uh how many of you remember coke shaped bottles with colored sugar water inside remember those the little candy uh when hula hoops first came out all right uh, did any of you put peanuts in your 10 cent uh glass cokes yeah i remember people doing that even when i was a kid all right all right so the, so we're starting to kind of Look back, you know. All right, this is my last one. How many of you were alive when there were still party lines on your telephone? Okay, all right, okay. How many of you remember big band music? Like when it was actually like out, like, okay. All right, okay, all right. You can all sit down. Everybody can sit down now. Now, here, here's why I'm sharing all of these things. I'm sharing all of these things because for each of us, we all have a different idea of what the good old days was like, right? How many of you have caught yourself doing that? I've been catching myself doing that more and more. Remembering and reminiscing, remembering things from the past, something that, was, that just really stood out to me. I, I want you to know today that when we remember Jesus on the cross and what he did for us, the, the good old days have nothing on what still lies ahead. Don't dwell so much on the good old days. The good old days are actually ahead of us. And that's the beauty of the cross. But there's something else about communion. Not only do we, do we want to remember, but communion is when you allow Jesus to confront you. And that is repentance. That is repentance. When you are confronted by Jesus asking, Jesus, just like he, he asked Judas, he's, what he's asking, he says, are you really going to continue to do that? Is that really the, the, the best thing that, that's, that's the best thing for you? We need, that re, we, we need that confrontation in our lives. And really, communion has a part of that in it every week. Jesus wants to challenge you to pause and to reflect upon those things. And then in the middle of that, he wants to show you his love to motivate you to not continue doing it. That in your life, there is something that you need to repent for. But even more so, there are things that you have allowed in your life to go on and on, and, and you've not really allowed Jesus to confront you. And you know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 5, he says, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sometimes that gets left out. Sometimes, yes, we like to focus on what Jesus has done for us, but... But Jesus also confronts us because he doesn't want us to be the same. He wants us to be different. He wants his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And in your life and in my life, that requires a confrontation every now and then. Really, I wouldn't say every now and then, every week, every day. It's that important. Repentance is that important. Communion is also something else. Communion is when you can rejoice in the living presence of Jesus with others. And, and this would be what I would call renewal. Often during communion, we, we can forget about the future times of taking communion with Jesus. Communion, if you think about it, when we, as we participate in, and have it every week, it tends to be a toned down time, doesn't it? Quieter. But really, there should be an element of communion that's a celebration of what it has done in us and what it means for us in our future, in the renewal that has come as 
Jesus died on the cross for us. You know, D.R. Carson said this. He said, whenever the church gathers around this table, it not only looks back to the cross, it looks forward to Jesus' return. Communion sometimes, is, in some faith uh, Christian traditions, so, communion is sometimes called the Eucharist. You ever heard that before? The Eucharist. And that comes from a Greek word. I've got it up here for you. It's Eucharisteo, which means to be thankful or to give thanks. I think that, that makes total sense when it's called the Eucharist because it's a time for us to be thankful and to give thanks to God for what he's doing. It's a time of celebration. It's a time of renewal in our lives. In Revelation chapter 5, it says, And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. See, they are giving worship to Jesus in this moment because of what he has done and the renewal that he has brought to every tribe and nation, language and people. We're renewed. You can, you can show grace to a friend because grace has been shown to you. You can live with hope about the future even when, you've been confront, when you are confronted with a bad marriage or you're being bullied at school or you're having a hard time on your team or you're struggling with a relationship with a coworker. Whatever it is, we can still have hope. We can still have renewal because of what Jesus did for us. And that's what communion should remind us. Because when communion transforms from a routine task into a deep connection, it will revive and renew your life. We're missing out, I feel like, a lot of times on communion every week because it's turned into a habit. It hasn't turned, or hasn't, it hasn't been made into something where you truly connect and be redirected in your life. You know what, through the years I've had people tell me after a service, things like this. They'll say, Danny, I really enjoyed the sermon today. Or, Danny, the music today was great. Or, or that prayer time was great. But you know what? I was, I was really thinking about this this week. I can't remember a time, maybe there was one somewhere, but I can't remember a time when someone said, wow, that communion time today was powerful. We should have more of that. Because that's what we're here for. <laughs> Yes, it's good to hear a message and pray and worship. Those are things we should do. But we are here to connect and be redirected by Christ. And that is my hope for each of you. You know what? I, I want to call it something. Maybe, maybe this is a, a tool that you can use during your communion time. We're going to call it the three R's. Okay? The three R's of communion. And what we've just went through. During your communion time, you need to have times where you remember. Remember what Jesus has done for you, but also remember some of the mistakes and some of the shortcomings you have in your own life. There's a time of repentance where you allow Jesus to confront the sin in your life and you repent to him for that sin. And then third, there's a moment of celebration where you give him thanks for the renewal that he is doing in your life. These three things should be a part of your communion time. And if you do this, if you truly do this, you can have a communion time that truly does connect and redirect you. So let's take a moment here and just be quiet. I'm going to play a short video as we prepare to take communion together.